Hey, thanks for joining this week as our online message. And just want to welcome you if this is the first time you've been here. We've been in this series for the new year called Almost. The first week we really talked about um, how a couple guys in our church are going through a study uh, in a book called Creatures of Habit. And there's a foreword in there that really jumped out at me. And it talks about when Jesus is having a conversation with some religious leaders. He asks them what the greatest commandment is. And they answer in Leviticus uh, specifically on the idea of that it's uh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then how we are to love our neighbors. And Jesus really goes into this concept with them. How important loving the Lord and our neighbor is better and more important than sacrifice. And so he literally says in, in Mark chapter 12, verse 34, how <clears throat> they are so close to the kingdom of heaven. And that really bothered me because in the foreword I read, it talked about how uh, if we're not careful, we can be close, but not close enough. That, that we might be destined for heaven, but uh, we are almost loving spouses, almost loving husbands and wives and fathers and mothers, how we can almost have the integrity we're supposed to, all this, all this concept of just almost. And that was really scary to me because I don't want to be almost. I want to be all in. So if there's a place in my life that is almost, then I'm kept back from fear and the rest. And so we went through really that idea of the two disciples after Jesus was resurrected, walking along the road and how Jesus joined them and really how sometimes we're blinded. We're blinded because the Lord isn't ready for us to see the truth, but other times we're blinded because we've chosen to be blind, because we've chosen the world, and how it really takes the Lord to open our eyes, how it takes Jesus to reveal himself to us. And last week we talked about this idea and concept of what what God's calling us to. And in Matthew 7, the difference in being uh, a foolish or a wise builder, and the difference in a true and false disciple, that uh, we really have one choice, or there's two types of people, but we have one choice to make in the moment, and that is we're going to choose to hear and obey, or we're going to hear and disobey. And so today we're going to talk a little bit more, and I'm going to briefly talk about a parable in Matthew 25, but in the end, we're going to come back uh, to the earlier chapters of Matthew, and, and it's always amazing to me that when we serve Jesus, using our gifts and our talents to meet the needs of people around us, how we become salt and light. And, and, and there's this concept of salt and light to people. And before we talk about that concept, that concept um, and those scriptures specifically, the concept and idea behind it is ultimately pointing them to God. And so it's very easy for us to be almost when it comes to how we reach people, how we share with people, and what we do. That always brings me to Matthew 25 on the idea of these parables um, that Jesus tells. And there's several parables in Matthew 25, but the one that jumps out the most to me about almost is, is the parable of the talents. And so uh, you have this master who is represented, um, who turns out to be Jesus when you study it. And he's ultimately going to be leaving for a while. When he leaves for a little while, he's, he's entrusting three people uh, with his inheritance to carry on and do something with. And with one of them, he gives five talents. Another one, he gives two talents. Another one, he gives one talents. And they're, they're responsible to do something with them while he's gone. And so the one that he gives five and two to actually do something with them, and, and they're given a return. And it actually is a double. And when, we've get, when we're given what they what they have, they're given to what their abilities are and what their capabilities are to do with. And the one who's given one talent just goes and buries it. And so the story goes on with the master and the master returns and he saw the ones that had doubled with what they were given and brought really great joy to the master, the scriptures would say. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. The one that buried what was given to him ultimately was rejected and considered lazy. And, and what, we, what he was given was then ultimately taken from him and given to the one who did so well with the five that was given to them. So a talent is actually a measure of weight. And in these cases, it's the idea of the weight of gold, the weight of silver, the weight of anything else in those things. 
But ultimately, the story is about stewardship and stewarding what has been given to us. So the funny thing is, is that the one that was given five and two actually received the exact same reward, which means we know that there's not a favoritism of it being better for you to do, to steward more or less, because lot, in the end, the Lord only gives us what he knows we have the ability to do, because he's given us the ability to do those things, but the reward in the end is the same. So it doesn't matter if we've been given five or if we've been given two or even if we've been given the one. The reward is based on faithfulness. And so all of the parables in Matthew 25 called for God's people to really live lives ready for the master's return. And so I take that concept and that idea and this whole idea of almost, and I ask myself, am I living my life ready and prepared for Jesus's return? I mean, these, these passages speak specifically on the importance of being moved to action rather than complacency or fear. And this famous parable really demonstrates a call to the, to the doers of the word, that we are to become doers of the word, just like we talked about last week, not to be only hearers and deceived, as, as James would say, but to be hearers and doers of God's word. Even though there are different types of workers, there is a call to the same purpose of Christ's kingdom. We are all called to disciple. We're all called to do something with, with what the Lord has given us. So who, who did the master and his servant represent in this passage? Well, the talents that Jesus discussed, the master of the state himself represents Christ and his being here, leaving everyone with a gift, leaving for a while, and then his second coming, coming. And the servants were God's people. It's those of us who were believers in the Lord. And just as the master entrusted his possession to the servants for profitable use, the same, the Lord has entrusted us to steward the gifts and talents that he has given us. And so he's delegated those things to us. And this parable really emphasizes the role of human responsibility under the calling of Christ in a person's life. So there's the eternal joy promised to those who walk faithfully in his ways. And so it's really, if we want to not be almost in our life, we have to understand that God has given us things and we have a choice to do something with them. And so his call is to forsake these earthly securities uh, and really focus on the things that are infinite and that are in him. So a life lived in step with service of the great master, of the will of the father, is what we're supposed to do. And each servant was faced in that story with the choice of whether or not they would honor the master with faithful service. And I believe if we're, if we're almost, if we're not choosing the will of the Father, and that there are places in our life we do serve him and other places we've chosen to not be obedient, that we fall in that almost. And that's not where I want to be. You know, when we look at this, the one who received five talents produced five more. The one who was given two likewise earned back the same. But the one who, who really received uh, any reward, the one that was five and the one with two, it really shows us and affirms that it's faithfulness that matters most. They were faithful to the master. They were faithful to Jesus. And I want to be faithful to Jesus. But the servant who received only one, who actually buried it, instead of being faithful, he was ultimately motivated by fear. Because it talks about in that story that he, he there was rebuke rather than praise, that he failed to have a good view of the Lord. He, re, he, he saw his master as harsh. And so out of his fear, he buried it just so he could give it back, declaring him harsh. And he ultimately is trying to reap what he doesn't deserve. And that's a bad perspective of what the Lord is. That is not a true perspective of the Lord. And so it came down to a failure to act faithfully on the behalf of the master. And so when, we're, when we have a failure to act faithfully, it puts us in the disobedient category. It ultimately makes us almost. And like I said, I don't want to be almost. I don't want people to miss out on the fullness of Christ, and I don't want to miss out on the fullness of Christ. There's a story that was once shared with me of a, a gentleman who was uh, from Austria, and there was a village up in the 
in the hills in the in the Alps. And so the this young council came along and they hired this man in the woods. And he was hired to keep the streams cleared out, the the crevices uh, where the where the spring came through, uh, free of leaves and sticks and all these other things. And and so he would he would often get up every single day and he would faithfully and quietly go through and remove the leaves and the branches, wiping away the silt and areas that would build up to keep that stream that was fed by that uh, spring clear through and through. And by doing that, it actually created a very beautiful water that flowed through town that allowed the town to grow. The town had swans in it. There was beautiful, uh, beautiful places of fish and, and, and wildlife. And multiple businesses would have the water wheels. And then with all of that became a very attractive place for tourists. And the tourists would come along and out of the tourists, the village would thrive and it became attractive and it became busy and it became a really great place for people to come. Well, years down the road, as years pass, uh, the new town council was going through and looking at things and they looked at their budget and here was this budget that was paying someone that they didn't even know what he did. They didn't think he was valuable and they chose to get rid of it. Their question was, who is this old man that we pay? Why do we even keep him year after year? And so, so no one really ever sees him. No one ever really knows what he does, but they deem it necessary that he no longer needs to do his job. So by a unanimous vote of this council, they get rid of his job. Well, a few weeks, nothing changes. There's nothing going on. By early autumn, the trees begin to lose their leaves and the branches begin to snap off and things begin to fall and accumulate. And it isn't very long before all this sparkling water starts to be hindered by this buildup of silt and debris and all these other things coming along. Well, one afternoon, someone notices a slight yellowish, yellowish brown color to the water. And very soon, things build up and it becomes stagnant. And out of the stagnant, these beautiful water wheels quit moving, uh, wildlife quit coming, and including the tourists. And so quickly they call a city council meeting and realize that they made a mistake and that this man is actually very valuable. And so they hire him back and within a few weeks the, the wheels start moving again. Some of the wildlife stop coming back, start coming back and the tourists start to come. The water clears up. And out of all this, they realize that there was something about what this quiet man did that made a difference in the community that they had. You know, this story is more than just like an idle tale to us. It's really a, a story directly related to the times that we live in. You know, what that keeper of the springs really meant to that village in the Alps is what us Christians mean to the world. And what I mean by that is Christians, we may seem feeble or needless to some or um, unimportant or really small in the vast of the world, especially in so much of the world that doesn't believe in the Lord. But God help any society that attempts to move forward without Jesus, because we as Christians are his ambassadors and are assigned to positions of influencing, really, and impact, impacting the world very much like that man did in that village in the Alps. Jesus calls his followers to be a front line. He calls us where we have an impression in this world, an impression that of Jesus on people, and, and we're not called to live in isolation, and not to be separated from this world. We are to live in it, but not to be of it. So it's impossible to truly live, um, live a life in isolation and really live for the kingdom in private. We can't do that. We are called to be out there. We're called to be a light and we are called to be the salt of the earth. And so Matthew 5 verse 13 through 16 says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anyone except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. As a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand it, it gives light to all 
in the house. You know, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. See, we are here to be light. You know, sharing with Jesus sharing with his disciples in the Beatitudes that we talked about last week uh, it was essential in really them having that character quality that Jesus crowns with two brilliant metaphors called salt and light. And so these are essential in us being who we are to the world. And if we want a winning witness, then our witness needs to involve the salt and the light of the Lord. Now, these two descriptive terms actually inform us of, of so many things. You know, in the day and the age of, of really thinking of large images, like some people have questioned, why, isn't, why didn't Jesus call us something else? I mean, he could have called us the eagles of the world. He could have called us the lions of the world, the stars of the world, all of those different things. But instead, he says, you are the salt seasoning of the earth, that you are the light bearers in this world. Why? Because when you really break down what those two things are, there's so much about what the Lord has asked us to live on his behalf that represents salt and light. So what do those things do? You know, when we look at those things as salt and light, they have unique qualities. Part of their unique qualities is um, when, you, when you see them, they immediately have impact. When you taste them, they immediately have impact. They're noticed instantly. And they, it's very hot, hard to hide them. You can't hide light very easy. You can't hide the, the taste of salt in things very easily. Let's look at salt. The scripture says, you are the salt of the earth. Okay, and so it, it's, it's really become a famous term in a lot of places where it describes in the English language something that's genuine, something that's useful, something that's honest or straightforward, um, something that's without hypocrisy, which is what we try to be. And so when he says that we are the salt of the earth, it's a type of person. It's, a, it's, what, it's what Jesus wants us to be, is to be different, uh, identifiable as something specific. So what was Jesus meaning with that? Well, salt was one of the most common substances in the ancient world. The Roman soldiers were paid in salt. As a matter of fact, if they weren't paid, in their rations, they would revolt in that bit. And the English word salary actually comes from the Latin word salarium, which literally means salt money. And so the, there's an expression, the man is not worth his salt, is a reminder of the high value that salt actually had in biblical times. And so it's important to know what the uses of it was. It was a preservative, it was a flavoring, it was an antiseptic, and it, and it created thirst. And all of those are important because as a preservative, you know, its prime function was, was seasoning. Uh, it, it kept things from spoiling. I mean, think about that concept of when we're the salt of the earth, that, that we, are, we are eternally preserved in what that comes. You know, imagine the land, like think about, Think about our country with no churches. Think about it with no church-supported hospitals, no church-supported groups, no church-supported organizations that are ministering to people in need. Um, the church is what carries those on in a, in a lot of places in life. But salt is also a flavoring. It's a seasoning. And because of that, Christians, like, we're, we're here to ultimately be like a spice and a zest of life because our life is alive in Christ. It is very drastically different from those that are lost. You know, the, the Christian personification of how life is to be lived should be that of zest, should be that of zeal, should be that of excitement of doing the work that the Lord would have. That is a way for us to show the world Christ. You know, when you look at, at salt, it was an antiseptic in its day. You know, in ancient times, this was very crazy for me to learn, that because uh, babies' births were done very barbaric because there wasn't a lot of knowledge or a lot of understanding, uh, sometimes tools were used that would hurt the mother or the child, and so they would come out and they would have cuts that could possibly become infected because of their lifestyles, because of where they were born, because of their environment. So they would rub salt 
on the, the babies, which I'm sure was extremely painful, but it was to clean the wound and keep it from getting infected. You know, as Christians, our responsibility in being salt of the earth is to help people see the truth and and understand that we we can be infected by sin. We can be we can have have a need of healing that only Jesus can bring to our life. But salt is also thirst provoking. And, and I love the stories in the Bible of us needing to hunger and thirst after the Lord. You know there's a saying that says you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But there's actually more to that saying. And the rest of that saying goes that you can give him a salt tablet and make him thirsty. You know, as Jesus made people thirsty for God the Father, so do Christians make people thirsty for the real life found in Christianity. Like, what we live in the goodness of God can become contagious for those who don't know him and are willing witnesses when we are truly the salt. When you look at light, light is, brings forth some different qualities, but does the same thing. You know, Jesus not says that we are not just the salt in, of the earth. He's also saying that we're the light of the world. And if you look in the dictionary, the definition of, of light is a source of illumination. Think about that in revealing things. So when we look at it, it reveals, it awakens, and it warns. You know, it also dispels darkness. And, and as a Christian, if we're going to reflect the light of Christ, we, then we've also experienced how light dispels the darkness in our life, how we've been overcome because of the light of Jesus that's in us. And so it might be a slow process at times, but, the, but you can always tell when someone has Jesus. It actually brings a different light to their life. And it does what we call reveals. So if you ever walked in a dark room and didn't see anything, but when the light comes on, then everything in the room becomes revealed. You know, as Christ's presence in the world, we become his instrument to help reveal the truth to people. And because of that, and as the light of the world, there's an awakening in people, an awakening in men and women to the truth of that the kingdom has arrived, that the Lord has died on the cross and was resurrected to, to overcome our sins and to awaken society in the presence of God. This is the importance of us as the church to go out there as, as, as followers of Christ, to be that light to them. You know, and, and we all know that light can become a warning for us. You, you think about law enforcement and you think about uh, construction and the caution lights. You, you think about any of those types of things. You think about a lighthouse warning the ships that they're getting close to land, you know, we're here to help be a warning to people that they wouldn't miss out on their opportunity to know and love the Lord, to accept and surrender their life to Him so that they could have eternal life too and ultimately become salt and shining their light everywhere. So how, we need to make an impact. So how do we make an impact by being this? We are called in this salt seasoning and these light bearing things, you know, to make a difference, to make an impact. We do that by sharing what the Lord has done for us. There should be a sense of urgency in us. There should be something in us because of what we received that when we go out every single day into this world, that we want people to see that we're different. We want people to see that we have hope, love, joy, and peace in something other than our environment, something other than our circumstance, something other than uh, the material things that we bring to this life. You know, so we have to understand and recognize that there's a distinctness that comes in a difference of someone who is in Christ and someone who is in the world. If you do not have Christ, if you do not have the Holy Spirit, you will not be different in being the salt of or the light. It says there in Matthew 5, 13 and 14, it says, you are the salt of the earth. It goes on at the end of 14, you are the light of the world. Do you notice what's absent in that command? There is no word in there that says like or as. And this is important because we're commanded to be salt and light, not just to be like it. We're called to be it. And this is important, and this is distinct, distinct, because there is nothing like salt. 
and there is nothing like light. So if I have uh, some food, I can taste the difference between salt, between pepper, between cumin, between chili powder, between all of those others. There's a very distinct flavor in salt itself, and the same as in the light. Have you ever been with a group of people and someone started to tell an inappropriate joke? And in mid-sentence, they stop looking at you. And they realize that they did something that they shouldn't have. That's a distinctness that is ultimately coming through the fact that you are known as salt and light. You know, I, I can tell you a time in my wife's life, she was diagnosed with cancer. And so we left the hospital and we went to the cancer treatment center and we were ready to see the oncologist while we were there a counselor came to speak with us and this counselor all of a sudden started cussing in our little meeting and in the moment we went from crying and sorrow to being so blown away that we didn't know what to do and in that moment that lady knew that something was different about us there was something distinctly different in us because it set us back and we didn't engage in the same thing she was saying. We didn't share. You know, it's the Christian distinctness, really, that, that makes a difference in this world. That shows in those times something different. You know, in a business, it's called marketing. In advertising, it's called um, positioning. In sports, people call it strategy. In Christianity, it's called holiness. And this is really hard because in distinguishing a feature about us, it's what sets us apart from the rest of the world. Pascal said, the serene, silent beauty of a holy life in the most powerful influence is the most powerful influence in the world next to the might of God himself. You know, it's really important for us to stay close to Christ in our life. Because if we want to make a difference and an impact in this world by being the salt and by being the light, Jesus warns his followers in Matthew 5, 13. He says, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You know, the most important thing about salt is that in its purest form, it can never lose its taste. Salt will always be salt, and it's extremely stable compound. But when it is mixed with other things, it can lose its saltiness. And so we have to be careful in that because if we are mixed with the world too much, we can start to lose the salt of the Lord. We can stop being the saltiness that we're called to be. And, and that's something we have to be careful with, because if we're not salting the world, then the world is rotting us. If you want to shine in the night, we need to stay in the light. We have to keep our heart with the Lord. We have to keep what we do based off of the, the will of the Father in order for us to have that kind of Holy Spirit power to affect the people in our lives. A weekly contact with the Lord produces a weak influence in this world, but a daily contact with the Lord can become a dynamic influence and impact with the people that we see every day. Matthew 5.14 says, A city on a hill cannot be hidden. You know, our influence, whether it be great or small, will be seen. Whether we were given five talents or two talents, as long as we use it, the will of the Father for the purpose of glorifying God, it will produce fruit. Salt can be tasted, light can be seen. It's, in, it's encountering Jesus in our life. You know, secret discipleship doesn't exist. Our Christianity should be vibrant and it should be visible. It should be noticeable. It should be different than the world. It should have a distinctness. And salt in a salt shaker and light under a bucket makes no impact. It's not until it's put into practice and not until it's used that it becomes what it was designed to be. The way we need to do this is in our sphere of impact. Each of us have a, a sphere of influence. We have a place that we can make a difference in because God has put people in our lives 
that we can actually speak to, we can speak into their life and things, or we've built relationships that are getting to a place that allow us to share. You know, we, we've been in, in Matthew uh, 7 here on these things, but if you jump ahead 23 chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, we get to Jesus in Matthew 28, and in Matthew 28, he gives us the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations. And Jesus is ultimately laying this foundation as a worldwide challenge, and not even a challenge, it's a command. Like us saying yes to the Lord, we have been commissioned to walk this out in our life. Now the disciple, the disciples are to be salt and light. The sphere of the Christian's influence ultimately is the whole world. So everywhere we go, wherever we go on vacation, wherever we go throughout our lives, throughout our days for fun, for work, for anything, we are called to be his disciple, to be that salt and that light. And so God has called us to ultimately influence the world. And I believe with all my heart that the local church is the hope of the world. We are the place where you can be equipped and go. You can become saltier, you can become more light, and you can go make an impact and a difference wherever you go in that sphere of influence. Our role is to be that salt seasoning and that light bearer, regardless of what it is. But we are called to make a difference. And so you've been given gifts, you've been given talents, you've been given skills, you've been given all these things in your life that the Lord does expect us to not just almost do something with them, but to truly devote our lives and steward what he's given us well. So if he has given you five talents, then go make 10 out of them. If he has given you two talents, then go make four out of them. If he's given you one talent, don't be the one that buries it in the sand. Be the one that did something with it. You know, this whole concept of light and being a light really remind me we had a children's Christmas program here and, and it just always brings me back to that song this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine you know it, that always gets me this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine and what the message here is for how we are to live our lives as followers of Christ you know in the parable of the talents Jesus spoke of three servants who were entrusted with very specific talents and a close look at that scripture reveals that the third man's attitude towards his master impacted how he stewarded his resources. And that will always stand out to me because how my attitude is to Jesus is going to dictate how I steward the things that he's given me to do something with in this world. So will I take them and double them? Will I take them and use them for his glory, or will I choose to do what I will with them, either out of fear of walking in the will of the Father, or out of selfishness of only doing what I want to do? So I ask you, how are you using your gifts, your talents, and your skills that God has given you? Because my prayer here today would be that you were to use those to make an impact in the name of Jesus Christ right where you're at, in the sphere of influence that you have, by being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So, Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, and Lord, we pray to be salt and light. Lord, that we don't back down to fear and worry about your harshness or disregard by not having a reference of who you really are, Lord, and we give in to the selfishness of ourselves and our wants of the things of the world. Lord, let us be different of the world. We are here to live in it, but not to be of it. This is not our home. Lord, help us to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in this week's message. Hope to see you next time.